Good morning, everyone. My name is Cameron Wells, and I'm one of this year's directors of on-campus delegates. Our first speaker today, Mr. John Norris, is the executive director of Sustainable Security and Peacebuilding Initiative at American Progress. He has served in a number of senior roles in government, international institutions, and nonprofit organizations, most notably as executive director of the Enough Project. He has also worked as the Washington Chief of Staff for the International Crisis Group, conducting extensive field work and senior level advocacy for resolving conflicts in South Asia, Africa, and the Balkans. Mr. Norris was Chief of Political Affairs for the United Nations missions in Nepal as the country tried to emerge from a decade-long war. Mr. Norris is the author of several books, including The Disaster Gypsies, Humanitarian Workers in the World's Deadliest Conflicts, a memoir of his work in the field of emergency relief, and Collision Course, NATO, Russia, and Kosovo. He has a graduate degree in public administration. Mr. Norris will help us lay the framework for what the components of peace building are, who is involved, and the significance of preventing conflicts so as to ensure peace. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. John Norris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Cameron for the, the kind introduction, and thank everybody here. It's been a fantastically warm welcome, and it is so impressive that this is the 63rd conference that has been put together by students here. I think that's just an amazing tribute to the dedication and hard work of the student body here. Uh, I'm going to talk about peace building today. Uh, I don't talk about peace building in a very formal sense. I talk about peace building and prevention as covering a whole range of issues, everything from identifying and preventing conflicts from they, before they start, to humanitarian interventions, to helping the nation emerge from conflict after uh, it is engaged in one. So a whole range of activities that really make up what we call peace building today. And I know when you look around the globe today, uh, turn on CNN or open your newspaper any given morning, it's hard to think that we've made a lot of progress on peace building. You look at Syria, you look at Somalia, you look at the still unsettled situation in Libya, you look at Afghanistan, and it would be pretty easy to say that we haven't learned very much at all and we haven't gotten very far at all. Uh, but what I'd like to do today is put that in a little bit of perspective and look at what I would like to call the four great eras of, of peace building that we've seen over the last 20 years and make the argument that where we are now as an international community, where we are as a world in terms of peace building, is a lot like when you're starting to clean your room. You're about 30 minutes in, you look around, and it looks messier than when you started. <laughs> but you know you're actually making progress. Uh, and so I think in some ways, to understand where we are with peace building, you really have to uh, begin in the early 1990s, uh, an era that, uh, simply put, most people in the field and who have worked in this industry uh, simply call the bad old days. It was no surprise that the world turned into a more complicated, messy place at the end of the Cold War. The competition between the Soviets and the United States had really kept a lid on a lot of those simmering ethnic, religious, uh, irredentist, historical tensions within and between nations over the years. And from the comfort of the history class, from the comfort of a textbook, it's no surprise that things started to get pretty ugly pretty quickly. Uh, and the international community was absolutely unprepared for the onslaught of conflict, emergency, despair, war crimes that followed the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and to its credit, the international community did get one major piece of prevention and peace building absolutely right after uh, communism collapsed in the Soviet Union. Uh, it negotiated the successful transition of the Soviet Union into a single nuclear successor state. Uh, that four of the republics had nuclear weapons. Uh, they were able to negotiate it so that only Russia held on to nuclear weapons afterwards. Uh, it's a small and often forgotten piece of history, but in terms of conflict prevention, that is absolutely getting one of the big things right. Uh, but there were three nearly simultaneous conflicts that really underscored to everyone how bad the situation was and how bad the international community was at peace building. Somalia, Rwanda, and Bosnia. 
In a lot of ways, obviously, Somalia was the original sin, as it were. Uh, the initial humanitarian effort in Somalia was remarkably effective. Uh, the US and UN-led effort saved tens, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, but it moved into something entirely different as we began pursuing uh, Muhammad Farah Adib and trying to go after some of the warlords in Mogadishu. And for most people, when I say Somalia, most of you probably still think of Black Hawk Down. Uh, the infamous incident when 18 U.S. service members were killed in a day-long firefight in Mogadishu. And the fallout from those 18 deaths uh, was enormous in terms of U.S. foreign policy, in terms of peace building, and where we are as a world. Uh, it's something of a footnote, too. It's strange when you go back and look at the history that 18 Americans did die in the streets of Mogadishu. 700 Somalis were killed in that same firefight. 1,000 were wounded. And yet it was described in the press and perceived by the American public as a grave defeat for American power and American intervention abroad. Uh, and it had an absolute chilling effect that uh, suddenly in Washington, in Congress, in the minds of politicians, in op-ed writers everywhere, the idea that the United States would get mixed up in a foreign conflict or try to resolve a humanitarian situation overseas uh, just seemed like a fiasco waiting to happen. Uh, in a lot of ways, you'll still hear in policy discussions in Washington, D.C., people invoke the name of Somalia if they're worried about the U.S. getting involved in a situation on the ground. And it really, really frightened American policymakers away from these issues, which also helps explain why Rwanda and Bosnia were such a disaster. Uh, Rwanda uh, was my first real stint as a humanitarian relief worker. I was sent to Rwanda in August of 1994, uh, the things I saw there on the ground, the things I saw in the displaced refugee camps uh, changed me permanently as a person, uh, hopefully not in all bad ways. Uh, and I've stayed in this work since then, but uh, what happened in Rwanda was uh, biblical in proportions and absolutely stunning. That so we had 800,000 people systematically killed in 100 days. Uh, that is a rate of killing and death higher than we saw at any point during World War II uh, in the concentration camps. It was absolutely appalling. And it wasn't something that was unpredictable. We had lots of warning signs. Uh, there's a couple excellent books on the topic. I certainly recommend Samantha Power's book, uh, as well as uh, Philip Garavich's book on Rwanda. We had lots and lots of warning. The UN officials involved in uh, Rwanda sent messages back to UN headquarters saying that there were uh, large purchases of machetes, that the government seemed to be actively engaged in plotting uh, some kind of wide-scale massacre. Not only were these ignores, these warnings uh, systematically ignored at the highest levels of our government and other governments, uh, the French and others continue to provide those who would ultimately conduct the genocide with weapons, intelligence, and material even after the killing started. Uh, it was absolutely appalling uh, by any reckoning in any measure. Uh, and it was even stranger, too, uh, particularly being on the ground, that we as a nation stood by and did almost nothing uh, as the killings were taking place. At a time when the UN general in charge of operations said that even a handful of armored personnel carriers probably could have saved tens if not hundreds of thousands of lives. But we as a nation responded dramatically and very overwhelmingly to the flood of refugees, uh, even though those included lots of people who actually were most active in the killing, as they poured into what is now Eastern Congo. Uh, and so it sent a very odd message that we were willing to deal with the humanitarian victims of this crisis, but we weren't actually willing to do something about those people who were killing and being killed and actually get to the political and diplomatic root of the problem. Uh, and so it was obviously a very discouraging period as was what was going in, on in Bosnia around the same time. Uh, we had uh, a very bitter breakup of the former Yugoslavia. We had uh, ethnic politics playing out at their most brutal, uh, at a time when people thought it was just a thing of distant memory and distant history. We saw ethnic cleansing campaigns. We saw things that looked an awful lot like concentration camps uh, being stood up inside of Bosnia by Serb forces. And the world did very little. And it was the very poster child of how not to respond to uh, this kind of crisis, that we had a UN 
peacekeeping force on the ground, but there was no peace to keep. I remember having to go around uh, doing work as a humanitarian relief worker in a small gymnasium in Tuzla, Bosnia, talking to widow after widow whose husband had been systematically killed at Srebrenica as a UN peacekeeping force literally helped escort these men onto trucks to be taken away and killed later that day. Uh, it was absolutely appalling. The international community was as feckless as imaginable. Uh, and that, I think, in a lot of ways, was the end of the bad old days. Uh, after that, you know, I think the, the next phase, particularly as we got into the mid-90s, uh, was a learning by doing era. A lot of people were rightfully outraged by what they'd seen, what had happened, and the international community's absolute inability and failure to deal with these issues. Uh, and peace building and getting to a better place, like anything, begins with people. The fact that there were more and more people with uh, training on the ground who'd worked in Bosnia, who'd worked in Somalia, who'd worked in Rwanda, uh, humanitarian workers, diplomats, mediators, uh, they began to take things seriously and they began to forge a different way. And we saw a whole rise of institutional changes in the mid 90s uh, that were really revolutionary and quite dramatic. We had a new series of non-governmental organizations begin to stand up, uh, groups like the International Crisis Group, uh, where I went on and, and later worked. Uh, the work that Crisis Group does is powerful and quite simple. They take people that are absolutely expert in countries on in conflict, people that speak the local language, they put them on the ground, they do analysis, they make it public, uh, available to anybody who wants it, they make it available to uh, policymakers and political leaders, and they advocate changes that they think will either prevent conflict or end deadly conflict. And you know, it, it seems really simple, this idea that you would go around and talk to everybody on the ground in a war zone and come up with some sensible opinions of, of what to do. Uh, but it really wasn't done before. Uh, we began to see groups like the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva was established to facilitate behind the scenes negotiations between warring groups. We saw uh, new institutions developed within the U.S. government, an office at AID, the, the lead uh, foreign aid agency, uh, established a small office to do transition assistance because there had traditionally been a real gulf between the life-saving humanitarian assistance that was uh, given to people in situations and the long-term development programs. But there wasn't much in between. There wasn't uh, a lot of assistance that was given to countries that were trying to emerge from conflict. And they tried to figure out what are those things that you can do as a country is trying to make that very difficult transition out of war into peace. How can you help civil society? How can you help the media? How can you make uh, sure there's enough jobs that people don't see picking up the gun as the most attractive alternative? Uh, we had some groundbreaking research during the mid-90s done by the Carnegie Commission on Deadly Violence. It was the first real serious major institutional policy look at what was driving this new rash of failed states uh, and very complex emergencies around the globe. Uh, we had the CIA lead a uh, study group on why states fail, a failed states task force. And what they found was actually quite interesting and has actually held up pretty well through the years. Uh, the three factors that were most associated with a state actually collapsing when they look back, and obviously correlation isn't strictly causation, uh, but I think that the fact that they showed up again and again is really powerful. Uh, one was a high infant mortality rate. And in a lot of ways that might strike people as odd that a high infant mortality rate uh, is a sign of an oncoming collapse uh, and governments that are willing to go to war with themselves or others. Uh, but I think it goes to this very powerful sense that when a government starts, stops caring about its people, when it loses its ability to actually defend those people who are the youngest and most vulnerable, when it no longer cares about delivering health care at a local level, that is a real warning sign. Uh, the other two indicators were, one, a, a relative lack of openness to international trade, uh, places that were closed off, had fewer economic and political links over their borders. And the third one, which was surprising to a lot of people, uh, was that young democracies uh, were more vulnerable than actual autocracies uh, to serious and long-lasting upheaval. And I think that makes sense as well, in that when you've got a new democracy, your institutions are often weak. There's a tremendous surge in public expectation and demand for change. Uh, 
uh, which a lot of these governments uh, have struggled to meet. And that makes the conditions for unrest and conflict much more ripe. Uh, we also saw, saw, see important developments in terms of international justice, uh, that we saw uh, international tribunals uh, established for uh, the conflict in Rwanda, trying to hold those people into account. We saw a tribunal established for uh, the former Yugoslavia for war crimes that were conducted there. Uh, and they started off from as raw and as basic a state as you can imagine. I was so viscerally, physically angry when I was in Rwanda. Uh, the initial investigators and the initial effort by the international community to establish a war crimes tribunal for Rwanda consisted of two staffers who had one borrowed vehicle from the Danish aid agency and one laptop. And to think that for all that we as an international community spend on war and peace, for the hundreds of millions of dollars we delivered in assistance to refugees in the camps, that we were only willing to spend you know, $50,000, $100,000 to actually sort out who had perpetrated these massive crimes against humanity and bring them to account. Uh, but you know, that, that began to change, and that actually began to make more progress. And uh, the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was uh, actually fairly effective and, and began to mature fairly quickly. But this also led to an important shift in, in doctrine and in international law and how we view these things. Uh, the mid-90s was really the birth of what we now call the responsibility to protect. It sounds and seems amazingly simple. The idea that the leader of a country does not have an absolute right to do to his own people whatever he wants. Uh, the idea that you could just wantonly imprison, torture, kill, murder, maim, rape your own citizens seems quite self-evident, seems quite obvious. However, it was not the way international law had been built, structured, and run for thousands of years. The idea that sovereign states were not absolutely sovereign uh, was revolutionary. And the idea that there were certain conditions under which, if a government was so mistreating its own people, that the international community would actually intervene. Uh, and that was groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Uh, the state of international justice, the state of humanitarian interventions are still very uneven and poorly, poorly formed and have been very much done on a case-by-case -case ad hoc basis. Uh, but from the long view of history, people will look back at the middle of the 1990s as a sea change. And the other part that the international community really began to get right in the middle of the 1990s was it started to figure out what a successful humanitarian intervention actually looked like. Uh, again, it's not rocket science, but if you want a clear and easy barometer of how you would gauge whether any peacekeeping or humanitarian intervention is going to be successful or not, uh, if there is a capable modern Western military leading it, it very likely will be successful. If it is subcontracted to developing world militaries, it very likely will not. Uh, and it's not only because Western militaries are incredibly capable, and often have the sufficient firepower to change things on the ground and exert their will, it also means that once US troops or European troops and boots are on the ground or involved, it means that the stakes are so much higher politically, diplomatically, that the international community absolutely dedicates the resources to try to get it right. Uh, and that makes a very powerful difference. And so as the mid-90s turned to the late 90s, we had a series of things that actually looked like real honest to goodness wins as far as peace and peace building went. You know, they're uneven, they're imperfect, they're messy, any one of them. Uh, the second intervention uh, in Bosnia led by NATO, backed by US-led diplomacy, uh, guided by the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook, held in uh, Dayton, Ohio, not so far away, uh, actually led to a lasting and viable peace agreement that is still in place for Bosnia today. Uh, we saw a British-led intervention in Sierra Leone that brought the RUF, which was most famous for uh, lopping the hands off of women and children, uh, pushed out of power uh, and brought to court. Uh, we saw a successful Australian-led effort in East Timor that uh, led to East Timor actually becoming an independent state uh, and after some pretty severe bumps, actually being in a, in a much better place today. And we saw a NATO-led intervention in Kosovo uh, although hair-raising at times and, and definitely shaky as it was ongoing, led to all the Serb forces withdrawing from Kosovo 
800,000 refugees in neighboring states returning uh, within a matter of weeks, if not months. Uh, and Kosovo actually going on to gain its independence in a UN recognized fashion. And the other part that's really important on all of those relative successes was even though they were led by very capable Western militaries, there was a real effort by everyone involved to try to gather as much broad international legitimacy for actions as possible. Uh, the airstrikes in Bosnia were authorized by the United Nations. Uh, the intervention in Kosovo was led by NATO, the European Union. Uh, it didn't have a UN Security Council authorization, and the Russians and Chinese resisted. But there was a very careful effort to make sure that the UN was brought in afterwards, that there was a, a senior UN official on the ground. The peacekeeping effort was led um, under a broad UN flag. And we seem to have kind of gotten it right in terms of having a capable Western military involved wrapped around broader international legitimacy. And that brings me to the third era, uh, which was not a particularly good one. And I would like to call it the ostrich era that happened after September 11th. And a lot of things in the world changed on September 11th. And I think the United States in particular uh, had powerful collective amnesia about what works and what doesn't work in terms of peace building. Uh, and obviously, the two most powerful examples of that are Iraq and Afghanistan. I'll start with Iraq. Uh, we lost a lot of people because a lot of people did not think uh, Iraq was a justified intervention. Looking from the long view of history, you know, a lot of our international partners were right. The UN was right. There were not weapons of mass destruction on the ground. Uh, all those UN inspectors that uh, the Bush administration derided and poked fun at, well, they actually got it right because they were on the ground and they, their analysis was actually pretty good. Uh, but even after the invasion, we really did an awful lot of things that ostracized the rest of the international community that we sent a very clear message that not only did we lead the invasion by ourselves, we will lead the rebuilding effort by ourselves. And it was a terrible mistake that the whole cadre of people that are really good at rebuilding and working in conflict zones, you know, it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting bunch of folks by any measure of the imagination, uh, but it's wonderfully international that there are Italians who've worked in Sierra Leone, that there are Australians who've worked in Kosovo's, that there's uh, Peruvians who've worked in Nepal. It's a, it's a very interesting hybrid mix of people that bring an enormous amount of skill and talent to the table. And we pushed those people away in Iraq. Uh, and it led us to make some very, very silly mistakes uh, that actually accelerated conflict and really lost a very powerful opportunity to make sure that that was a successful rebuilding effort. A lot of the people that were put in charge of uh, rebuilding ministries and in Iraq and in Baghdad, you know, we had young campaign aides that were given control over the Iraqi stock market, uh, people put in the oil ministry who didn't know much about oil, people who didn't know anything about Iraq's history, didn't know anything about the people, didn't know anything about the place, didn't know anything about post-conflict reconstruction. And it's no surprise it was a disaster. It was no surprise that tens of billions of dollars were lost, wasted, uh, and went down, down a rat hole, essentially, uh, because we were vain and we were silly. And the attack on UN headquarters, uh, which claimed the life of Sergio de Mello, uh, uh, a ranking UN official uh, and person who had been involved in a great number of conflicts around the globe, I think further sent the message that this was a, a unilateral enterprise, scared away even more international expertise. It was the UN's single largest loss of life uh, in its operations uh, until the Haiti earthquake. And the other part of Iraq that I think was really a lost opportunity, uh, we put the US military in charge of a great deal of our reconstruction assistance. I love the US military. It is the finest military on the globe. Uh, I've got lots of good friends who work in the Pentagon or in the service. They shouldn't be delivering foreign assistance. That's not their job. They're not trained for it. They're not very good at it. Uh, and in both Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, military guys, God bless them, they go in, they say, you need a school? We'll build it. We'll get it done. And that's great, but that's not how it works in the real world. And that's not how you build peace. That's not how you get people to take control of their communities and change their lives. Uh, you know, so across Iraq and Afghanistan, 
the military would go in. They would build that school. And six months, a year later, they were absolutely baffled as to why nobody was going to the school, why it wasn't being used, and why it was falling apart. Because if you want to build a school in a community, I don't care if it's in the United States or Iraq or Afghanistan or where in the world, you need to sit down with people in the community first. You need to say, do you need a school? Did you have a school? How does it work here? If we were to work with you to build a school, how would it be maintained? Would you collect school fees? Uh, what kind of kids would go here? Would girls be able to attend the school or not? Uh, and we ignored all those basic questions. And it, it is absolutely breathtaking to me when looking back at Iraq, uh, some of the mistakes that we made. Uh, I'd recommend uh, The Emerald City, written by a former Washington Post reporter that details an awful lot of this stuff in, in great detail. Uh, but you start at the very beginning that we dismissed the entire Iraqi army overnight. That's something that any conflict studies grad student would tell you you don't do. I've worked in tiny little conflicts in Papua New Guinea where the first question you ask is, what are you going to do with the former combatants? They're going to need jobs. They're going to need a way onward. And if you don't take care of those guys, they are sure enough going to start fighting next week, next month, next year. In Iraq, we fired the whole army and said, you're on your own. And lo and behold, they were fighting our forces and fighting each other uh, within months after that decision. Looking at Afghanistan, you know, I think it's a whole different set of issues uh, in terms of why peace building and why our relationship with Afghanistan has been so extraordinarily difficult. Uh, in Afghanistan, we've never gotten the politics right. We've never gotten the diplomacy right. Uh, we moved our forces out too quickly to move them into Iraq before the countryside was stable. We've never figured out how to get all the parties around the table. Uh, and part of that also goes back to one of the other tendencies of the post 9-11 world that I found tremendously discouraging. And that's the idea that the world is drawn into good guys and bad guys, and we should only talk to the good guys. It's, if you care about peace building, it's absolutely ridiculous. We talked to the Nazis in the middle of World War II. We talked to the Soviets throughout the Cold War. The point of diplomacy isn't just to talk to your friends. It is to figure out how you deal with your enemies or people that you may only share a partial interest. Why not sit down with Iran to figure out if there is a peaceful way for them to not have a nuclear program? Why not figure out a way to sit down with Hamas and see if there's a way to renounce, have them renounce violence? We went so far as a country after September 11th that we actually made it illegal. It is illegal in the United States for me to offer advice to a militant group about how to come to the peace table. Think of that, that it is not only seen as wrong, but illegal for me to offer advice, whether it's Hamas or Maoist rebels in Nepal or any group, to say, look, I think you guys are crazy and wrong. Violence has gotten you nowhere. This is how it would look if you pursue a path of peace. This is what you need to enter in negotiations. We've made that illegal. So I think after 9-11, we went off in some very odd, strange, and, and counterproductive uh, ways. You know what? That would bring me to the fourth era and where we are today. And I'd like to call that the, the journeyman stage, as it were, of peace building. Uh, you know, we're not an apprentice anymore, but we're certainly not a master. Uh, the room is indeed half clean. Uh, I think the Obama administration did a number of things that were very useful when it came to power. Uh, it worked very hard to rebuild our multilateral relationships to show that we actually have some trust, faith, and willingness to work through multilateral institutions. And those multilateral institutions are, are very powerful uh, in terms of war and peace issues, in terms of peace building. I think the intervention in Libya was a good example of rebuilding that successful model from the mid to late 90s. Uh, it was military force that was authorized by the United Nations. It was supported by the Arab League. Uh, there was pretty wide buy-in. It was led by a very capable uh, set of actors, including the United States. Uh, you know, whether we've got the patience and ability to see the rebuilding through and actually make sure that Libya doesn't slip backwards uh, is a real challenge. We've learned a lot about prevention. Uh, we've learned that one of the most powerful things we can do for prevention uh, is to help nations from slipping backwards into conflict. Uh, that more often than not, those countries that are slipping toward conflict are nations that have had struggles with it before. Uh, 
getting peace building, getting reconstruction right is absolutely a, a central priority. Uh, and I think if you look at international justice issues, we've really come so very far from those two staffers, one laptop and one borrowed vehicle, when I was in Rwanda. Uh, the International Criminal Court is up and functioning. It's not perfect. Uh, it has a long ways to go. Uh, but the fact that Charles Taylor is in The Hague, uh, Slobodan Milosevic uh, was in The Hague before he died of a heart attack. Uh, we have seen more and more perpetrators of violence held to account. We've seen successful prosecutions. And I can tell you very powerfully that having worked in an awful lot of different conflicts around the globe, the people that are conducting and perpetrating this violence are paying attention. I get more questions about the International Criminal Court. Are you recommending that I be sent to The Hague from warlords? And you would imagine that they, they are paying attention. Just at breakfast, we were talking about someone, uh, a local warlord who spends a lot of his time watching the Hosni Mubarak trial. Uh, and he's worried that the poor man is being mistreated, I think. Uh, so my, my reservoir of sympathy for uh, uh, war criminals is, is fairly low. Uh, but you know, we have come so very far in this period of time. Uh, we still have a great deal of enormous challenges to get this right. But I think more than ever, we have a set of dedicated people that care about this, that work on this, that think about this, that are working to get it right. And the last thing that I would close with before I go to questions is the other element that we now have today that we didn't have in the early 90s is a much more agile, much more effective, and much more powerful advocacy community. We have people that are willing to stand up and say, this is wrong. You need to do something about it. We need to make a difference. That what happens over there is linked over here. We have a right, an interest, and a need to get involved. We cannot be a substitute for peace on the ground. We cannot make peace in any place where local actors are not committed to peace. But in countries that are committed to peace, in places where there is a core of people that are trying to make a difference and trying to get to a lasting peace, and that is most every place, we can make a difference. And the role of advocacy in the United States is controversial, and uh, the Coney 2012 video, I'm sure somebody will probably ask a question about. But the fact that there is an advocacy community, people in Washington pay attention. Uh, policymakers may not always admit it, but they do hear your voices. It makes a difference. And I'm much happier to be in a slightly half messy room today than I was in the early 1990s. Thank you. So we'll take some questions, and I believe we've got a microphone. Thank you for your talk. I wish at the beginning of the Iraq conflict they would have listened to you. My question, um, you said that some of the perpetrators um, left as refugees. Were they found, discovered, and held accountable? Uh, it's a mixed bag from Rwanda. The, the tribunal uh, has not had the, the smoothest existence. Uh, but a number of them have. Uh, and part of the real issue at the time was that you had these people who had conducted the genocide who had deliberately wrapped themselves in the middle of 800,000 refugees. And people on the ground uh, warned at the time that if there was not some effort by the international community to actually separate out the perpetrators uh, to deal with those people and the command structure from those people who had executed the genocide, from those people who were innocent refugees, that there was going to be a, a very serious long-term problem. And the United States and others were simply unwilling to do that. And that led in part, and in no small part, uh, to the long series of woes that have consumed uh, Eastern Congo since that time. And some more of that you'll hear from my uh, uh, former colleague, Sasha, uh, who will speak later today. Uh, so uh, we have seen a number of people from Rwanda uh, and the violence in Eastern Congo held account. Uh, we had a prosecution just last week uh, for somebody who'd uh, used child soldiers uh, pretty frequently. Uh, so we see pr 
we see progress, but there's still there's no enforcement arm. You know, the, when the ICC issues an indictment, there isn't necessarily anyone who goes out and immediately arrests anyone. And in a place like Eastern Congo, where there is essentially uh, not much of a functioning central government, uh, it has served as a, as a safe haven to a, a higher degree than any of us would like. Thank you for your talk here today. Um, I'm really intrigued by the idea that you talked about the responsibility to protect um, in international law as emerging as a legitimate idea. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that in terms of more specific, um, that the idea that the sovereign states are not absolute so sovereign in when they fail to protect their own citizens? Sure. It's moved in, in fits and starts. It began in the uh, 1990s. Uh, it was an effort that was uh, led by the Canadian government uh, and Gareth Evans, who ran the International Crisis Group and was a former Australian foreign minister. And you know, the, even the words responsibility to protect uh, were adjudicated at great length and very carefully arrived at. It wasn't that there was a responsibility to intervene or responsibility to act, but there was an onus on the international community to actually protect those who were most vulnerable at, at moments of great need. And uh, it has achieved a, a degree of support within the United Nations. Uh, there is a lot of unease among a lot of different nations about how R2P will be applied and used. Uh, Iraq and the invasion of Iraq was a real setback for the concept of R2P. Uh, it was unfortunate the administration, after uh, they didn't find weapons of mass destruction, tried to justify it on humanitarian grounds uh, when it was clear that humanitarian grounds had never been high in their thinking to begin with. Uh, but that reinforced the fear among some nations that R2P would be whatever the United States and NATO wants it to be. Uh, and so I think there have to be uh, clear benchmarks for what it looks like and, and how it can be measured and what are the conditions where we intervene and not. Uh, and it will be ad hoc for a period of time because the conditions that led to a successful intervention in Libya just aren't there right now in Syria. That the Syrians have Russia as a closer uh, patron and the Russians are less inclined uh, the neighbor states are more concerned. The actual logistics of an intervention, of how you would uh, conduct airstrikes or move troops is a lot trickier uh, given Middle East politics. And so I think we're in a period where we'll see the international community kind of pick and choose where it thinks it's got uh, both the ability to carry off, carry off successful R2P efforts uh, and where it's got the political desire to do so. Uh, from my own perspective, we've also seen places like Sudan and Congo, where I think the international community is, frankly, and Somalia, failed in its responsibility to protect. And looking at the peacekeeping efforts in, in Darfur and in South Sudan to a lesser degree, that's one where I think there is a desire by the United States and European partners to be seen as doing something, but not a willingness to actually make those very hard choices it would entail actually resolving the situation, either through the use of force or through more effective diplomacy. Uh, so we continue to see both Congo and Sudan and certainly Somalia on kind of a long, slow boil uh, with tremendous ramifications for the people there. So I think we'll continue to see support uh, grow within the UN over time. I think the role of newly emerging nations like uh, Brazil and India will be very powerful in shaping a broader consensus around R2P over time. Uh, the idea that nations that are seen as leaders within developing nation community speaking up in defense of R2P uh, would be really useful, uh, but that's certainly not guaranteed. The South Africans, uh, another nation that I'd add within the rank of emerging developing nations, uh, have not always had a very warm view towards R2P um, for a variety of political reasons that I won't go into right now. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for being here and for sharing and for all the work that you're doing. I'm wondering, in your experience, 
what has been the most difficult conflict for you to navigate, especially because, like you were saying, it's illegal for you to go in and help bring people to the table and promote that peace-building process? Um, you know, it's working in conflicts, working in conflict zones, it is uh, so dependent on the day, the weather, your own mood, how you're dealing with what's going on on the ground. Uh, it's incredibly variable uh, that you can go through one route 15 times with no problem and on the 16th day some horrible disaster happens that uh, some days you head out into a place that is in absolute misery thinking that you can change the world by yourself uh, and fix it other days you wake up and you're like my god this place is never going to get fixed. These people are impossible. My bosses are driving crazy, and none of this is ever going to work. Uh, you know, that I have been lucky to travel and work in a high number of conflict zones, and I still have all my fingers and toes, and uh, in an industry where there are lots of casualties. Uh, but the other part is, you know, it isn't about me. And that as a Westerner, as an American, there is a degree, I won't say vulnerability, because there is not vulnerability, uh, invulnerability in these places, but I've got a higher degree of protection than the locals. And the people that pay the absolute highest price, the people who take the greatest risk, the people who suffer the most, are all the people who live in these places. Uh, the people that are helping me get from interview to interview, uh, the people that are giving me information about uh, where the guns are being shipped in or being shipped out, uh, the people who make sensible political situations, even though they may not benefit from it personally, those are the people that take enormous risk uh, and really make a difference. So uh, I have been fortunate. Um, my mom occasionally says that I need a new travel agent. Uh, but, um, you know, it's great engaging work if you care for it. So, um, so far, so good. Hi. Um I want to start off by saying that uh, a lot of what you say uh, sounds very encouraging, and, and I don't want to sound as though um, I'm being critical of it, but rather that it uh, raises a couple of questions in my mind. Um, notwithstanding what you said about how we got it wrong in Iraq and Afghanistan, it sounded to me as though when you were talking about issues like Kosovo or Darfur or Somalia, that your recommendation was that the United States and the Western European powers, the developed countries, ought to be doing more to resolve these issues, including putting boots on the ground and intervening militarily. And the reservations that raises in my mind are um, a couple. First of all, whether this could be seen as neo-colonialism by some people, um, whether um, it discourages uh, the more regional forces from taking responsibility for the problems that perhaps they understand better and might be better resolved within um, that region. And also to the degree to which it can be justified to the American public as to why American soldiers should be dying to solve problems that don't immediately affect our own interests. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good point. And uh, to clarify, you know, those cases were all the most extreme that I talked about. Uh, and I think if you look at the important developments in peace building over the last two decades, uh, the ones that aren't in the headlines are also some of the most powerful and most important. Uh, we've gotten much better at having political negotiations. Uh, that We are much better at looking out for minority rights. Uh, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, has done a fantastic job uh, across uh, Eastern Europe, former Soviet space, of adjudicating minority rights, figuring out peaceful solutions, figuring out things that uh, haven't risen to the point where there needed to be a military intervention. Uh, I spent two years of my life working in a, a UN peace support operation uh, in Nepal. We were there to facilitate a political process to work on negotiations between the formerly warring parties. Uh, we had uh, 186 arms monitors from all over the world. None of them had a weapon. None of them had a gun. Uh, I think 
they were more effective for not having weapons and guns in terms of ensuring that this was a Nepali-led process and something that they did. Uh, but there will be cases and instances where the situation gets so out of hand that there is little alternative but to have some kind of humanitarian intervention, which may include force. Uh, it is a last resort. Uh, I think that a lot of these situations, if we had dealt with them sooner, uh, we would not have been in that position. I think if our response, certainly in Rwanda or Bosnia, or any one of these situations had been, had put more emphasis on diplomacy and effective diplomacy, uh, smart sanctions, those kind of things, you know, we could have kept it from getting out of the box much earlier. Uh, but when you get to the point uh, where you're talking about hundreds of thousands dead or uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees are displaced, you know, it is a hard question. Do we not do anything or do we do something? I would advocate that we do. And I think that as uh, the examples of Afghanistan and Iraq aside, because neither one of those was humanitarian interventions, uh, and both are somewhat anomalies in terms of what we're talking about today, uh, we didn't lose a single soldier in Kosovo. Uh, we didn't lose a single soldier in Libya. Uh, we've gotten pretty good at figuring out ways uh, to put real pressure on force on a warring party without a high cost in terms of American lives. But it's obviously a risk. Uh, but, you know, I think that the American public, if you ask them broadly, their first reaction is to say, yes, we shouldn't be involved over there. We have our own problems at home. Uh, but I think that if you take any American and say, and show them what is going on in a place, they say, why aren't we doing something? You know, we finally had a successful intervention in Bosnia because the American public was outraged after seeing footage again and again of people going to a marketplace in Sarajevo getting shelled, shelled from the hillsides and slaughtered where they stood for the crime of trying to go out and get some vegetables to feed their family. And so uh, it will bring charges of neo-colonialism uh, at times. It will bring charges that it's not the right thing to do. Uh, but I don't think that you can really look at, at Bosnia today or Kosovo today or East Timor today or Sierra Leone today and say that we have somehow set up a puppet government or we have set to colonize the place or done much more than try to sort out some reasonable, lasting, durable peace. So there will always be those arguments. It will always be controversial. And it will always involve very difficult choices in terms of American lives, American blood, American treasure, uh, as well as that of our allies. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I feel very strongly that we do have the resources and capability uh, to affect positive change in some of these cases. And I think the, uh, the downside of not doing so is more powerful than we realize. I think that if you look at uh, Somalia, a place where we fled, and I think that is the proper word, after uh, Black Hawk Down, you know, we have continued to pay an enormous price as a nation and as an international community for what goes on in Somalia today. It is a hub of international extremism that is increasingly spreading to Central Africa. We spend billions of dollars a year in higher insurance premiums for shipping companies. It gets passed on to American consumers. It's become a hub of narcotics trafficking, weapons trafficking, uh, in addition to extremism. Uh, and we continue to provide uh, billions of dollars of humanitarian relief, including last year when there was a famine. So to think that we don't have an interest in these places, I think, is to neglect how global our presence is and how interconnected we are with the rest of the world. And lastly, the part that I think is probably most powerful for me is that I think it's the right thing to do. And I think that if you look at the, the grand sweep of history, uh, up until the early 1990s, mid-1990s, uh, every year since the 1940s, we as a world had averaged over 100,000 combat deaths every year. Year in, year out, the average stayed over 100,000. In the last decade or so, it's dropped down to about 20,000 combat deaths a year. You know, and that is a real shift. And that's 80,000 less people getting killed in combat every year. So there is a price for that. 
uh, I think it's one worth paying.